Hey, Rube. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. Back from the combine. We're uh, we're a week away from free agency, so it's things are happening now. We're getting to that point in the off season. Yeah, before you know it, it'll be training camp and preseason games and joint practices and opening day, and here we go. Yeah, got to see who's on the team first. There's a lot of questions. Oh yeah, left to be answered there. Is Jalen is Jalen going to be on the team next year? Yes, that's all that matters. <laughs> well, I think there's a little bit more that matters, but uh, we'll get into some of those things today. Actually, this is the Eagle Eye Podcast presented by Nissan. He's Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Uh, some coaching turnover to discuss a little bit. Uh, we want to get into Jalen Hurts and that contract that we think is upcoming. The turnover in the secondary uh, is a big topic of conversation. And then at the end, we want to hit on some of the offensive free agents this team has because we've spent so much time on defense that I don't want to lose sight of some of those offensive players that will matter. And um, some of those guys are going to have to replace, but uh, the newsiest item from an Eagles perspective, since the last time we spoke to everyone, uh, Denard Wilson, the defensive backs coach is gone. He has now recently uh, joined the Baltimore Ravens as their defensive backs coach. Rube, what do you make of all this? Yeah, and I, I think once uh, w- once the interviews, like I guess when it became apparent that Gannon was at least a candidate for head coaching jobs, we kind of assumed Denard Wilson would be the the replacement for Gannon if he left, and then Gannon did leave, and then they just started inter- interviewing everybody. Uh, what was it? Nine candidates, including Denard. But as that process went deeper and deeper, it kind of became more and more apparent. You know, these aren't courtesy interviews. We're going to meet this guy and this guy and this guy and then, you know, and then hire Denard. I think as that process went along, those, you know, that first few days after after they started interviewing people was kind of seemed like they're not going to hire Denard Wilson. And um, and, and that turned out to be the case. And then when when Nick at the Combine said, I don't know if he's going to be back or not, that was pretty much the death knell for his days in Philly. Uh, you don't say that, and then you know if you have any doubt about whether he's coming back or not. So, I kind of understand where Denard's coming from, and uh, he he got bypassed for a job that he and a lot of other people felt he deserved, that he earned. Uh, players really feel strongly about him; they they like him, they they respect him. And you look at the the season they had. I mean, Bradbury bounced back season, second team All Pro, Slay uh, fifth Pro Bowl career year from Chauncey Garner Johnson, five, six picks in 12 games. Uh, Marcus Epps, first time starter, really first time full-time starter. Uh, you, you go right through it. Reed Blankenship out of nowhere playing good football for, for this team. Number one pass defense in the league. So you go right through it and it's a really good reflection on, on Denard. And uh, I don't blame him, honestly. And, and, uh, The irony is, I think to me, is that he was going to be more different than, like the internal candidate was going to change things more than the guy they brought in from outside. Because I think Sean Desai is kind of a, you know, has the same vision of defense as Jonathan Gannon. Not that that's a bad one, but uh, I think we kind of know that Denard Wilson had a more aggressive approach in mind that maybe didn't. Uh, job with what Nick Sirianni's vision of defense is. And uh, John Harbaugh does. <laughs> yes, he's a very aggressive coach. So it kind of makes sense. It's a shame it worked out this way. Uh, but uh, he's in a good situation now. He's from there. He's from uh, Hyattsville. Uh, went to Maryland. So he's, he's got connections in, in that area. And, and uh, you know, and good for him. He's got, you know, he's, he goes to a place where they have a lot of talent. Yeah, no, that's true. I, you know, I think the dynamic would have been difficult. I don't know if the situation was really tenable to have him right. come back and work under the guy who got hired over him, uh, especially with, look, now there is going to be a ton of turnover in that secondary. So it's not like, you know, all those players are going to be back under him next year if that was the case. But I think enough of them that might have made things tricky. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what it would have been like. I think Denard's a professional. I, I don't think it would have been like um, crazy, but I and don't think there were, there were reasons to move on. Guys have done that. I mean, like 
you can make it if you're Jason Michael, you say, well, how come I didn't get that promotion that Brian Johnson got? And I, you know, he's he's been an offensive coordinator before in the NFL. He's called plays. Um, I don't think you know. I, I, so I, it's it's kind of a. I guess it depends on the circumstances, but um, yeah, I totally get it. I totally get why it, it wasn't going to work. I think Nick knew that the minute they decided on Sean Desai, I think he knew that Denard wasn't going to be back with him. It was a little tricky because it's late in the process, and you know most teams have their have their staffs put together by the middle of March or second week of March is where we are. Uh, the Ravens lost one of their secondary coaches to Chip Kelly of all people, UCLA. So they had an opening and, you know, and, and, and here we go. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it was kind of inevitable. Uh, and, and I guess for me, when they started getting onto Kennedy four five and six, and, you know, in that process, it's like, he's not getting the job. And if he doesn't, he's not going to be back. Yeah, and we'll see what Sean Desai's staff looks like. They haven't finalized that yet. Maybe by the time you guys are listening to this, you'll know. And we don't know right now in, in our present, but uh, they have to move kind of soon, you would think. You'd think they want to have it in place by the end of this week. Yeah. Yeah, they have a few coaches to hire. Nick's got, got some work to do on that. And um, the whole position's really – the whole secondary is really in flux. And I, I wonder how much, if if at all, uh, Denard's departure will affect free agents. Uh, generally, guys are going to go where the money is. Yeah, I think sometimes a lot of the other factors kind of get overblown. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it could be a factor. It could be a, a tiebreaker. Um, I don't think anyone's going to turn down more money um, you know, just to, just to not be here, but, uh, it is something to think about. Sure. And, you know, uh, along those lines, we've heard the report about Matt Patricia perhaps coming on board as the linebackers coach. You wonder what that would do to the locker room. I mean, I think that's fair to wonder. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. But yeah. But, yeah. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, obviously the Slay, the Slay thing, he wouldn't be his coach, but still. Um, I mean, if BG can get along with, you know, uh, Washburn's son, and eventually Washburn himself, I mean, you can, you can work through that stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, BG playing for Washburn's son is a lot different than Darius Slay seeing Matt Patricia every day. Yeah, no, there's no question about it. He's been pretty public about his feelings. About about that Patricia as recently as Super Bowl week. Um, yeah. And, you know, if I, I, I don't think it's going to happen, but if, if it does, how does that affect Slay's future? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, people are speculating about trading him. I don't think that's going to happen, um, but, but we'll see. I don't think Patricia will be here. I do think Slay will be here and, and on we go. Yeah. I mean, well, let's, let's get into that in the secondary because it is kind of a, that whole position group right now really in flux. We don't know who's going to be back. I mean, the one, the one guy that you really pencil in, well, I guess there's two, you can pencil in Slay and then assuming Avante is healthy next year, which after this year is a concern, but you pencil him in as the nickel, you have three other spots to fill. Yeah. You have three other spots. You have Reed Blankenship, who I think, um, if I was a defensive coordinator, I'd feel pretty confident moving him in to a starting safety spot from what I've seen this year. Now, it's a little different, you know, going from a spot starter to a to a full-time starter. Epps made that transition this year um, with mixed results, I think it's fair to say. But um, I feel pretty good about where Blankenship is, and uh, I think he's only going to get better. Um, so I think he'll likely, certainly not a slam dunk, but likely answer one of those questions. But yeah, after that, you know, you have Zach McPherson who really hasn't played much, played more last year and he's been okay, but that's a big jump. You say, all right, he's played, you know, a couple hundred snaps in two years as a backup filling in here and there uh, to become a full-time starting corner. I'm not sure he's, um, he's at that level. Obviously they have a couple first round draft picks and it's a deep cornerback draft, but that's an unknown. You don't know what you're getting. Um, 
You could be getting Lido. You could be getting Sidney Jones. I just don't know. Um, so, yeah. And uh, and Epps, I mean, I mentioned Epps, and he's a free agent too. So there's just there's so many question marks. Um, I think a last resort is Avante outside. I, don't know, I hope we never see that again because he's not real. That's not really what he's what he should be doing. Uh, but they've they've got a lot to answer, and all this with with coaching changes. So um, you have the number one number one pass defense in the league losing potentially three starters and a coach. Yeah, it's a lot. Um... Now you feel where's your confidence level that they'll be able to bring back either Epps or CJ Garner Johnson? Obviously, the, the the money is going to be much different. I think with CJ, you're probably talking in that what 11, 12, 13, maybe 14 million yep. per year. Epps would be significantly lower than that, but he's also he's not as good. Yeah, not as good, doesn't have the ceiling. Um I don't know if the, like it, the, the timing of this whole offseason is going to be fascinating to me because like I think they're going to go after CJ, but then is Epps going to be around long enough that they can, you know, if they don't get CJ, they can put that money somewhere else and have enough money. Like all these things have to fit together and there's no guarantee the timing is going to line up the right way you need it to. Yeah, I would think I would think that they would be confident or how we would be comfortable signing Epps without knowing what's going to happen with Chauncey Garner Johnson, because I mean, you know what the money's going to be for, for CJ, you kind of know the ballpark. Uh, I don't think Epps is going to cost a whole lot. Um, the, the benefit of him is that out of all the cheaper guys, he knows the, well, he doesn't know the defense because no one knows the defense, but he's been here. Uh, he's a very smart guy. I think that's kind of his, um, gosh, I mean, talking again at the Super Bowl, I mean, he's, he says he's the smartest player he's ever been around, uh, one of them. Um, so his ability to come in, he, he's just not that good. I think he's limited. He's a big hitter. Um, but, you know, he's a liability in coverage, and he's just he doesn't run. I mean, he doesn't run real well. Um, but I think you can safely – look, if you, if you have I, – I don't think they're going to be able to sign – Gardner Johnson, personally, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about it. I just feel like it's not going to happen. I think it is going to happen. Do you really? Okay. Yeah, I, and now it might come down to do you do you sign him or do you sign Javon? And that's a really tricky thing because Javon's probably going to cost more, but he's also five years older. Yeah, yeah. Chauncey Gardner Johnson just turned twenty five, and that's to me like I, I look at him and I see the age and I think, you know, if you sign Javon or Chauncey to a three-year deal, what are the odds that they're playing their best football in that third year? Right. With with Chauncey, I think the odds are pretty good. With Javon, they're just not because he'll be 33 at that point. But he also plays a position that's not as dependent on running. And, you know, we see you see defensive linemen playing at a high level into their mid-30s. You don't really see defensive backs doing that. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, Chauncey won't be in his 30s, so he'll be 28. No, no, I, I understand. I'm just saying, just as a comparison, as far as age and how you, how you factor it in. Um, honestly, so Javon will be Fletcher's age, or he'll be older than Fletcher is right now. He will, he will be older. Which than Fletcher. We've seen that decline, and I don't know if yeah. you want to sign up for that again. Yeah, I, I think the fact that. I mean, Fletcher was also not playing his best football at 30. At, at Javon's age, he was already declining. I think Javon might have had his best year this year. So that gives you a little confidence in, um, in that. I, honestly, if I had one, if I had my choice of, of Hargrave or, or CJ and they, how he might not have that because I mean, Hargrave on some lists is he's the top free agent out there. I mean, he's going to get 20 million. If he gets 20 million, I think he's gone. I, I don't know if they can afford that. Well, if you if if they do that, they won't be able to afford much else. Uh, but just from a personnel priority standpoint, he'd be he'd be number one for me ahead of Chauncey. You mean like the way they value position? Importance? Just if I could have one or the other. Okay. I, I just yeah. Is and, that is that in, like that's taking away the money aspect of it? Yeah, just the player. Okay, that's yeah. probably fair. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Um, but that's not how this works. <laughs> it's not how this works. Yeah. Um, and it's a big difference. I mean, because you could probably get Chauncey Garner Johnson for like six, seven million dollars a year, a million dollars a year, not dollars a year, uh, less than than Hargrave. Just I mean, defensive tackles are that's a premium position as far as salary. Um, safety is not. So, but it's also like in terms of importance, you, like I, I don't think any people are going to argue that safety is a more important position than interior pass rush. Interior pass rush is huge in the NFL right now. Yeah. And honestly, the Eagles are a big part of why that that is. And we've right. seen them, you know, like it's 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 really hard to envision them going into a season next year without Hargrave or Cox. It's true. Yeah. You need some interior pass rush. Do you think if they don't sign Javon, and this is a way off topic, we're supposed to be talking about the secondary, it's more likely Fletcher returns? I'm not sure one affects the other. I have no sense of how much Fletcher wants financially. Um, as if he's much still, as someone will pay him. <laughs> I mean, does, is he still looking? Is he still thinking? I mean, the way he talks, he still feels like he's an elite player. I'm not sure he is. He's Okay, um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that number would have to be, uh, but yeah, I guess that does make sense. I mean, I guess that because I mean Fletcher still does give you some some pressure up the middle, and they wouldn't have any if they don't have either of those guys. Yeah. It's I mean it's literally the entire middle of the defense. It's two defensive tackles, two linebackers, two safeties. Got to be strong up the middle. That's what I always say. <laughs> you got to find some players there. Uh, but I mean, and it's easy to say, let's just talk about the secondary, but it is all linked. It's all, it all works together. And, and uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out because, like you said, it's a, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. This affects this, this affects this, that affects that. And, and it, it just kind of permeates through the whole roster. And, because it's just there's so many guys who are up. What do you think about the CB2 spot? We haven't talked about that yet. And we haven't talked about Bradbury, who is one of their top free agents. I think you and I are kind of in agreement that it, it, it's most likely he signs elsewhere to a deal that the Eagles can't keep up with. But then how do they replace that? Because Zach McPherson's the top internal candidate for a team with you think is going to have like another playoff run in them. Super Bowl aspirations, that's probably not going to be enough. Do they draft someone? Can you just plug and play? It, that's becoming a little easier, but it's also a lot to ask for a rookie to just, yeah, oh, you're the CB2 on a team that's in the playoffs and Darius Slay's on the other side, so the ball is coming your way an awful lot. Good luck. Yeah, I think we touched on this in the last part of it. I just think you're a lot more likely to get that guy as a rookie than maybe 10 years ago. Just the way the positions evolved, the way college offenses have evolved, guys come right in. Whether it's Sauce Gardner or you know, whoever, the guys come right in with their confident and and they play at a high level. Um, so if you get the right guy and they do have the tenth pick, um, and you know we'll see what else they have or where they end up. But if I had to guess now, I, and Josh Joe, by the way, is a guy that I think. I think they kind of like who knows what his future is, but um, he'd be, the, I guess, the only other guy in that mix of, of uh, returning guys. But um, I think it'll be a draft pick. I think it'll be – I think they'll draft CB2 this year. It's interesting because the last two years they've signed that player late. Yeah. Steven Nelson two years ago, last year, James Bradbury. So I don't think they're going to like force it in the draft. Like I, I don't think they're going to panic. Now they've gotten some ideal circumstances that one of those players happen to be, or both of those players happen to be available. But given that they've done it that way, the last two seasons, I don't think they're going to panic and like overdraft the corner to plug and play him. I mean, and, and this could be a situation where we're in May going, who in the heck's going to play corner for this team and, and they haven't found it yet? Yeah, and that's just what we went through. 
uh, last year. And last year was a little different because you knew the Giants were going to have to. So, I mean, they were trying to trade Bradbury. So you kind of knew he was out there. You didn't know you're going to be able to sign him. So there's 30 other teams, but uh, I'm not sure there's a player in that position this year. Um, I'm sure they'll keep telling us Zach McPherson <laughs> if they're looking. Uh, but I also think the first round is, I mean, we'll see how it shapes up, but the, I mean, he might, how he might be able to get out of 10 and still get a corner pretty, you know, starting caliber corner in the first round and get, get a pick back too. Um, just cause there's such depth at the position. Um, but yeah, I, so you're talking about trading out of 10, picking up a, the pick in the teens, adding a, maybe a third or fourth. Yeah, exactly. You know, you get get out of 10, get to, you know, 16 to 20, get your corner and get a three. Something like that. It seems like um, it could work. I mean, we know how he wants to – he wants picks. We know that. He doesn't have those – he doesn't have those middle of the draft picks this year. Um, that will drive him crazy. He's going to do everything he can to recoup some of that. But um, – if they feel like there's good value there in the middle of the first, even the, the end of the first, even the beginning of the second, where you can you can still get really good corners in the second round. Uh, I'm not going to go on my Eric Allen speech, but yeah. Um, well, that was a while ago. It was, but I think I think it's still. I mean, heck, Jalen Mills was a seventh round pick, but won won a Super Bowl with him. Uh, but in general, yeah, uh, I think it'll be. <laughs> I think with I, him or because of him is a big distinction there. But yeah. well, hey. He, anyway, I don't want I don't want to relive that, but um Julio Jones play. But uh I I wonder if how we would have approached last year any differently if the Bradbury situation with the Giants wasn't there. Like how much did he think, all right, I'm gonna get this guy? Um I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. And even go back to like when they acquired Slay, that was because they struck out in free agency and the prices got crazy. So they were, yeah. so uh, he finds ways to get corners. It's kind it of does. worked for them, but uh, like it, it might be time to draft a corner just because like, e- even aside from CB2, Slay's 32. Yeah. Like you, I don't know how long you want to piece this together. Like you, you want to try to find a blue chip cornerback at some point that you can build around. Who's the last one they drafted? Who's been like a legitimately like good, good player? Like just a good player. I'm not talking about Rasul Douglas who had some moments, but like a good long-term answer corner. I don't want to hear Eric Rowe's name, by the way, who's had a nice career, but it wasn't here. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going back pretty far. You go back to Lido. Yeah, I, you do. That was 20 years ago. So, yeah. Um, and I almost feel like Slay being 32 is as much a reason to draft a corner as Bradbury being a free agent. I'm with you. It obviously works hand in hand, but it's an important position. And it's a position that, for whatever reason, the Eagles haven't valued as much uh, in the draft. And and we know that they're, they're always going to put it into the, the offensive and defensive line. They always think they have need there. And it, look, that strategy has worked for them, and I'm not right. saying they should alter that. You have a ch- if you have a chance to get your version of Pat Sertan, you do it. Yeah, find 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 a guy who blows out his Achilles at his pro day, and then get him for then steal him in the second round. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I think that's what's going to happen. But yeah, you like you said with Howie. Um, but I think unless there's a specific guy he's got in mind that, you know, I'm, not, I'm just not sure there's a corner in that position this year, uh, but he finds him. That's, that's well, for sure. I mean, those top three corners, there, there's some disagreement on the order of them. And we don't know how the Eagles are ranking those three, but it generally seems like Christian Gonzalez, Joey Porter and Devin Witherspoon are, are kind of the consensus top three. Some people have like, you know, Cam Smith sneaking in there or Manuel Forbes, like one of those other guys. But for the most part, it's like those three guys and we see different rankings of them. So depending on how the Eagles line them up, it's conceivable that 
the but the guy they think is the best of that position is there when they pick a 10. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's no no question it's possible. And then if one of those other guys you mentioned is, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's we're still a ways out from that, but um I think that I think they should definitely consider going corner at some point there in the first round or early in the second, if they, if that's what they end up doing. But um, I feel like it's time. I mean, because you can only patch with veterans. I mean, gosh, they won a Super Bowl with Ronald Darby and Jalen Mills, but I have to be really careful when you say Jalen Mills. Not, kind of not used to saying Mills at the end of Jalen. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, Ronald Darby's available. But, yeah, they – you can only do that for so long, patching with these veteran guys. So, uh, uh, but they've it's worked for them. So maybe he'll keep doing it. Maybe, yeah, we'll see about that. Uh, some news on this Tuesday, right before we started recording, uh, the Eagles did not uh, put the franchise tag on anyone. We told you they weren't going to do that. Uh, they did not. The only one that would have made an inkling of sense was CJ Gardner Johnson. But then you've got this chunk of 14.5 million dollars that all counts this year on your hands and that's just not they're not in that position from a cap standpoint to do that so that doesn't happen but the other news from around the league we always hear that deadlines spur action it happened here for the giants they got their daniel jones deal done some preliminary numbers from tom pelissero <coughs> four years 160 million 35 million in incentives it's eighty-two million over the first two years. He's not that good. I, if you're an Eagles fan, how do you react to that? You relieved? You happy? Yeah, I mean, I look, he, he's a good player. He's a good player. He runs around. Um, but for, the, for their franchise, like they they were kind of backed into a corner. Like, yeah, if he's the guy, he's the guy. You got to pay him, but. Ugh, you know. Yeah. And they, they also slapped the franchise tag on Saquon. So it's, you know, the, the roster management, a little questionable, but I understand the individual moves here. Daniel Jones has never had a passer rating over 93. <laughs> like these days, like 93 is like below average. Um, yeah, I'm. I mean, he runs around. He makes some plays. Yeah, I think he's um, he's a smart guy. He probably gets the most out of his ability. Man, I wouldn't tie my franchise to him. But yeah, they they really didn't. They didn't have a whole lot of choices in the matter. So um, you're better off signing him than having to franchise him. Well, yeah, and that's what they were kind of coming up against right now. Was were they going to be able to to get that deal done or was it going to end up in a franchise tag? And we see that can kind of lead down a, a road they don't want. We've seen it in Baltimore with Lamar and um, yeah, a little fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm curious to see how Giants fans are reacting to that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hit up the message boards when we're done. What would you make of the Derek Carr move, by the way, for uh, Derek for Carr got less money than Daniel Jones, which, He's I like real. Derek Carr. I think I I'm higher too. on Derek Carr than most. I do too. I think it's a. I think it's a. It's a good signing for them. They they got him cheaper than Daniel Jones, and it kind of changes the landscape of the NFC a little bit. I, I think he's really good, and he's been really consistently good for a while. Um, you know, in that in that dome, he's going to throw for a ton of yards. I mean, he throws for a ton of yards wherever he is. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've got a good defense. Um, you know, he's a top 10 quarterback to me and, um, makes him a much better team. Yeah. What do you think it all means for Jalen Hurts? Is, do these contracts matter at all? You would think so, but I don't know. I, I think, I think there's a number out there, um, I mean, we knew he was going to – the thing that worried you is if if Daniel Jones ended up getting like $46 million a year, you know. Yeah. Now, 
now you're like, all right, the whole thing is just kind of out of whack. But I mean, we kind of knew he was going to end up, he was going to land in that, in that neighborhood of 40 million a year. Um, so I don't think it's going to, I don't think anything is going to affect the Jalen contract in, unless somebody gets like an all time, you know, one of the remaining guys gets like a 50 million type thing. Then, yeah. So the, yeah, that's, it looks like it's 82 million guaranteed over the first two years, but it's like 40 million a year, 82. Like, so I don't know if it affects Jalen that much. Yeah. I don't think it does. Yeah. I think it's going to take it's going to take a uh, you know like a, a fifty million dollar deal to affect Jalen, and even that might not because I think there's a number there. I think both sides know what it is. It's just a matter of come uh, structure and you know the Eagles don't. I mean Jalen and the Eagles don't have that built in deadline uh, like the Giants did. I mean, there's artificial deadlines like we got to get this done, and I'm sure time is of the essence because you got to build a roster. Um, but um, yeah, I don't think it does affect it. I think there's a number out there, and that's where they're going to end up. You said that people have been asking you why extend Jalen now because he has another year on his deal. Did you want to address that a little bit? Yeah, and I mean, it, it's a it's a good question because. He's got another year on his contract. You could franchise him after that. Uh, although, I mean, the quarterback franchise number is going to be north of forty million next year. And in general, you just don't want to franchise guys. I mean, it's just like 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 Dave just said, like you just said, <laughs> you're Dave. It just throws your cap out of whack because you have this one giant one year cap hit. The whole thing's on your cap. Uh, you can't spread it out. There's no. There's no. There's no tricks. There's no. You know, put this here, put that there. You know, voidable. There's no voidable years on a on a. It, it's just money in that year. As soon as the guy signs the deal, so it's it's a last resort. Now, there's some positions where the number's lower, and but generally, I I think ideally you don't want to ever do it. Basically, you just don't don't want to do it because basically you're letting the the franchise tag tell you what the contract should be unless, instead of you and the player agreeing to it. But um, as far as Jalen, his price will go up in a year. If you wait uh, and assuming he plays well next year and there's no reason to think he won't, he's got, he's got the receivers. He's got, um, you know, he's got the coach. He's got the, the scheme. Um, he's gotten better every year. But even if he plays the same, it doesn't get any better when these other contracts come in and the cap goes up and you know, not, you're not going to get him for whatever the number ends up being this year, 45, you might not get it. You might get him for 50. So the longer you wait, the more the price goes up and you also risk losing him. You know, if, if, you know, say he, he has this incredible season, he's like, well, he didn't want to sign me. I'm not coming back. Uh, you can't play that game. You can't take that risk. Now I don't, think that would happen but you, you never want to go into the last season uh, of a star player's contract w without redoing him and uh, i mean most quarterbacks never play on the final year of their deal I, I don't i don't have any stats to back me up but i just they don't never gets to that point so um from a financial standpoint and just having you know showing the belief in the player um, standpoint. And I know a lot of people are like, well, they did that with Carson and see what happened. He's not Carson. He went to a Super Bowl. Carson threw for three yards in his playoff career. Uh, anybody who can't see the difference at this point uh, between Jalen and Carson, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it, Jalen's Jalen came up so big in the biggest game of his life. And Carson's the opposite. He he just comes up really small in big games. He, that's just what how it's gone. So I don't know if that's fair. Well, I, you look at like the Jaguars game with the Colts. Just for example, you okay. know. I mean, in his Eagles career, he played in one playoff game and he got knocked out of it. Oh yeah, I, I was thinking more of the, the the game against Jacksonville at the end of the uh, twenty twenty one season. But I mean, he's we didn't have that information to operate on. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's true. But I mean, I, I still I wouldn't call him a big time. I wouldn't, even that play in that in that game, 
he he was he shouldn't have even been out there. He should never should have happened. By the way, did you see the video of Josh McCown? It was floating around yesterday after that game, uh, after that playoff game. Oh, I, don't, I I didn't see it yesterday. Maybe I saw it then. I'd never seen it. Somebody somebody tweeted it to me. It's it's really incredible just how emotional he was. I had no idea. Somebody, I, it must have been an NFL uh, Films camera, showed him by himself. Uh, between the tunnel and the locker room, like you know how it kind of turns, so nobody could see him, and he was just there, and he was like sobbing. I mean, he knew that was his his only chance, his last chance. He'd never played in the postseason, and um, and Zachers came over and kind of got him back up on his feet, and uh, and then they had some some clips from the press conference he did after that game. But anyway, it was pretty it's pretty well done. I'm sure it had something to do with his muscle being removed from his bone. Yeah, they could have been part of it. Uh, but, man, it's got to be, you know, you wait 20 years for that opportunity. And, you know, anyway, that's off topic. But check it out, uh, I would say to everyone. because And the soundtrack is uh, the band Black Pumas, who are great, great band. Um, yeah, that song, Colors, which is tremendous. Anyway, off was topic. Was that the song I was playing? Yeah, in the, in, the, in the soundtrack on the video. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was really well done. So check that out. Kind of f- tend to forget about that game and that season. Uh, and then they showed like clips of Doug after that game. Doug was really good in those moments, talking to the team. Anyway. Um, but, yeah, as far as Jalen, that's why you got to do it now. I mean, he, it just makes no sense to wait at, in, in any way. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to. I mean, I, it, everything they're doing – publicly is all about getting him that contract. They haven't tried to hide it. Uh, I thought it was telling even, you know, how he was asked about having basically having a cheap quarterback to start off the press conference in Indianapolis. It wasn't uh, an Eagle centric question. And he basically said, no, thanks for bringing that up as we're about to pay our guy. Uh, you know, <laughs> so he, he knows the situation. They're not trying to hide it. They're yeah. not like, th- there's a, there's an impetus to rush it a little bit just to, to get it done now you're paying more as time goes on but it's not even about trying to like get him for cheap because it's going to be a huge deal and i know it's going to be a huge deal it's just about kind of hammering out those numbers and i think we'll see it this offseason yeah i do too i think in the near offseason i also think howie won't be entirely hamstrung before that deal gets done he'll, he'll be able to function I think some of the big decisions he might not be able to make, which could end up costing him, but um, like whether they resign TJ Edwards or, or, you know, Kaiser white, or but maybe not Kaiser white, but Marcus Epps, TJ Edwards, Boston Scott, like he'll there's, I mean, he, I think he knows what that framework for that Jalen deal is maybe not the exact structure, but he knows kind of where it's going to fall. And so he knows what else is available in, in each year. And he'll be able to do some things around that. Maybe not a lot, maybe not everything, but um, I I think it's not like you're not going to see any moves at all uh, until Jalen's done. That's just, that's my theory. Yeah, you're probably right. At Nissan, we just made your choice for a new car, an easier one than ever with our most exciting and fuel efficient lineup. The choice is yours and get great offers across our full line. Shop your local Nissan store today at NissanUSA.com. Catch all the sports action in Lawrence Rivers Casino Philadelphia, whether it's the money line or the pass line, there's something for everyone in a great sports book. Rivers Casino Philadelphia. Philly loves a winner. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Opioid addiction is a national public health crisis. The Someone You Know podcast from the Independence Blue Cross Foundation offers inspiring stories that challenge stigma, offer hope, and humanize the disease of addiction. Download the new season three of Someone You Know on all major podcast platforms. Rube, we did it earlier in this podcast. We talked about all these defensive free agents, and that's really the highlight of next week for the Eagles is are they going to be able to keep some of these guys? But I don't want us to lose sight of their offensive free agents. We have a list of these guys here. I want to run through them, and, and we already did stay or go for this whole team, but let's talk a little bit about these individual players. Uh, you want to go alphabetically? Is that the best way to do this? Sure. Let's go alphabetically. Alphabetically, we'll start with Andre Dillard. 
who you actually had staying in our stay or go that to me, that was one of the biggest surprises of that entire series was you had him staying. Cause I think he's almost definitely gone. I think that's one of the ones we disagreed with or, uh, each other the most on. I think he's just going to find a place where he can at least challenge for a starting gig. Wait, you got the version. I think I sent you the wrong version. I, I, I had him go. I changed it. I have him going. No. Um, I thought you were serious for a second. No, I'm not okay. I have done that though. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think that was just a kind of a gut feeling. Like I, there's always that one guy you're like, Oh, they, they brought him back. So I think he's kind of in that category. Um, I just don't know what the market is for him. Uh, I don't know if he played enough guard for people out there to think, well, he could play guard for us. Uh, I th- so I think he'll be a swing guy no matter what. And if he's going to be a swing guy, maybe he'll be here. That that was my my mindset. But there could be somebody out there who looked at his at his tape and he played some guard in the preseason, played a lot in the preseason, um, and say, you know what? We can get him fairly cheap. He can do a lot of things. He's versatile. He needs a clean start uh, and, and snap him up. Uh, but um, they certainly aren't going to – pay him a whole lot. <laughs> they don't really, they don't have that luxury and they have, you know, they have Driscoll, they have Sua, they've got guys, they, you know, um, they've got some, they've got some, some guys who, who are versatile, but uh, yeah, we'll see. You're, you have your mind made up pretty much that he's not going to be here. Yeah. I mean, I big V got paid, you know, we did. you know, those guys are getting paid. I think but he the guy also who was a started, first- down the stretch on a Super Bowl team. Yeah. I mean, Do you think Big V, when he got paid, was better than Andre right now? I don't. Okay. Yeah. I don't, but the Lions did. Um, it only takes one team. I get that part of it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think, think he was going to end up somewhere competing for a starting job. Well, I hope he gets it. I, I hope that happens. Yeah. And I don't Even think he's going to play guard. I'm saying – you do? I don't think he's going to play guard. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but I think Big V really earned that money by – what did he play, the last eight games mm-hmm. in the postseason in mm-hmm. 17? And, he, I mean, he played really well. Played really well in the Super Bowl. So, um, I don't think Diller's going to get as much as Big V did. Okay. Yeah, you're probably right about that. But I still think he's going to get paid more to be somewhere else. Sure. Okay. Fair. Next one is Jason Kelsey, and like some lists include him, some lists don't include him because he it's just such a special circumstance. Technically, like he's not even a free agent because the way the contract was structured, it basically has a, a trigger date where <laughs> it's something silly they wrote in. Like if he's on the team on this current contract by this date, it's like 40 million guaranteed next year. You know, it's something crazy just to, to make sure like there's a date that they have to figure this out by. Right. Um, I think he's back though. I think he's back and I think he's making the same money he made this year, which is like 14 million. I think he's back on that 40 million. I think how he forgets <laughs> Kelsey doesn't remind him. <laughs> he can tell he's got so much going on with, with Hertz and CJ Hargrave. Forgets all about Kelsey's forty million. Um, no, I, I love I'm, some of the silly stuff they write into, like the dummy years. They don't like; they're not even real years, but they'll write it in for the heck of it. Yeah, yeah. I always wonder if there's a reason for the amounts that they. Not know, normally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm. I just. Uh, I guess my gut feeling is he won't be back. I say he's going to call it a day. That's my gut feeling. I think he's back. I, I look at him and I think he's still playing at such a high level. Jalen being here matters. Stout being here matters. You're also turning down $14 million, which for anyone is a lot of money. He made it through this season relatively healthy. We've had some of these years where he gets to the end of the year and you're like, man, how is he even – how is his body working right now? He didn't really have that this year as much. I asked him <laughs> – I asked him, I think it was the week before the 49ers game. I asked him how he was feeling. It was just at his locker BSing. I said, how are you feeling? And he looks at me and he goes, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I can't walk, but I'm fine. <laughs> I'm like nothing. It's like the usual stuff. Um, he doesn't tell us also when he's going, like we'll hear like he just had surgery for you know, 
this or that. But uh, not, not not that he said that. I'm just for example, he he doesn't he'll never complain about an injury ever. Um, I don't know the 14 million. I mean, he's made. I'm guessing he's made 80, 90 million in his career. Um, I mean, I'll look at his career earnings while you're talking. Oh, you got that special Spotrack uh, subscription? No, right. over the cap is better, and they do it. Okay, well, I, I use I use Spotrack, Spotrack, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, look that up. But you know, he's got over the cap has him at seventy one million. Okay, let's see what what Spotrack has. I'm going to say Spotrack. I can't I can't handle that Spotrack. You go over the cap, please. It's better. No. Okay. I like. I think Spotrack looks it looks better. It's a better layout. They have them at seventy point two million. Okay, um, so it's same same ballpark. But you know, he he's just had his third kid. Um, if that's not a reason to go back and play football, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah, he was joking about that. Like, that's, you know, um, I yeah, you know, he's got a lot of other interests. Um, what is he thirty five? Mm-hmm. Just a gut feeling. I can't. I mean, there's. I'm, it's not based on anything except, you know. I mean, he went to a super, won a Super Bowl, went to another one. Um, does he really want to crank it up and go to through another training camp? And not that he's going to practice that much. Uh, probably chasing after the baby would be more of a work that he gets it at training camp. But yeah, how about and, thirteen million? We'll see you in September. Could be, you know, and this is a topic for another day, but you think about how short Nick's training camp practices were and how guys had days off. Now the season went through like the middle of February. It's going to be even lighter next year because, you know, when you're a Super Bowl team, you want to, you know, really you gotta install a new defense. So, yeah, Jason Kelsey's not going to be worried about that, but just in general. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to guess that he won't be back, but I hope he is. Yeah. Gardner Minshew. And we don't even just have to talk about Gardner, but that spot is one we haven't probably talked about enough yet. That backup quarterback spot is an important position yeah. on this team. It's the reason Jalen Hurts was here in the first place was because they wanted a, a cost-controlled backup quarterback for their starter who was injured a lot. You know, um, Obviously, it grew with them more than that, but uh, – they don't have a ton of money to spend on a veteran. I could see a scenario where Minshew ends up back if there's nothing else, but I, he wants to play and he knows he's not going to play here. Yeah. I'm not sure he's going to get that opportunity. Um, maybe coming off 2021, he would have. Um, it, it, actually, when you look at that Dallas game, I mean, it really, he really wasn't bad in that game. Um, he was, he was fine in that game. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Saints game. He was he was not good. Um, I just don't know. I don't know if anyone's gonna, you know, how they're gonna look at him. Um, there might be a team with a little bit more cap space willing to throw some money at a backup quarterback. Well, I'm trying to think if there's a, a free agent quarterback out there. Maybe a guy who's been released recently, um, who has a house in Philadelphia. He's. He, uh, he's not going to be looking for much money because he's made 125 million or whatever. Uh, I guess that wouldn't happen. Yeah, I don't think that's likely. Yeah. At first, I thought you were going with the other guy. Other guy. Until yeah. you said 125 million. Oh, oh, Nick. Yeah. I think Nick's more likely than Carson. But uh, Ian Book is is the only other guy under contract. Um, I don't think they look at him as a Potential too. Yeah. He fourth was round pick. He was a fourth round. Not pick. their fourth round. Uh, pick. Saints was it? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. He. I mean, he's he's a guy who. It's funny because I made I was going through all the former Eagles backups that became coaches, and it's an incredible. There's like so many guys who are backups here became coaches. Most recently, T. Martin. Uh, but and Josh McCown's coaching with uh, with Frank mm-hmm. in Carolina now. There's a ton of them, but um, I'm not sure. But yeah, they might be. They might have to go with book just financially. 
I mean, I know he's a smart kid, and he he. What's uh, the earliest they would draft one? Yeah. First round. <laughs> well, they probably wouldn't use a first round pick, but I think a second round is unlikely too. They don't have one four through six, right? At least right now, think... like, is third round completely out of the question? I think it's completely out of the question, but I would be on the phone with Jalen so fast. Say, look, you're, you're the quarterback. Don't don't get any ideas here. Um, yeah, I'm not. Sh- it's it's an interesting question because you know you you have to have somebody if you if you're a team with Super Bowl aspirations. You know that's why that's why Gardner was here. I mean, he's won games in the league. I think you want a guy who can win games, and I mean, obviously you do. A guy who's won games, who's shown that he can. Um, it's a shame sure. Jacoby Brissett played so well this year. Yeah, <laughs> he's gonna make too much money. Marcus yeah. Mariota is a name that I hear get tossed around a lot. I mean, that makes sense because your offense wouldn't need to change as much, right? Well, like a different type of quarterback. I'd love to, I, you know, we, we thought he was coming here when Chip was the coach. So <laughs> I know like seven years later, here he comes. Yeah. Um, I think that's the kind of guy that, I mean, again, you don't know what, what they're looking for financially. Quarterbacks just make a lot of money and, and even backups. It's hard to, it's hard to find a bargain who you trust to be your number two. So um, it's a tricky one. I don't think, it, I don't think it'll be Minshew. Um problem is it's like you look at the free agent list and i don't know if you're going to find a better cheaper replacement for him but does he want to be here you know yeah. unless he's like well jalen's gotten hurt in each of the last couple of years it'll be an opportunity to play at some point um i mean most co- quarterbacks don't play 17 games anyway um so you got to look at it from his from his perspective does he want to be here does he want to be in a place where he knows he's going to have no chance to be the starter as long as the quarterback's healthy. I don't know. Yeah, probably not. That's probably not like tops on his list. But like you said, I don't know if the other opportunity yeah. arises for him. Yeah. Uh, the next one is Zach Pascal. You know what? I'm going to say Mitch will be back. <laughs> I'm just I'm going to say he'll be back because I think it makes more sense than any of the other alternatives. Okay. Even though I don't think he'll be back. I don't know. So you got to have somebody in that role. I've never heard someone hedge so much in my life. At least I'm not like that person that said there's a 50 50 chance that uh, that the Giants will, will uh, come to an agreement with Daniel Jones. I mean, if you're reporting that, you can't be wrong. Whatever happens. So I'm yeah. just going to report that there's a 50 50 chance that everything's going to happen. <laughs> and people pick it up. Oh, NBC Sports is reporting there's a 50 50 percent chance, 50 50 chance that Kaiser White will resign with the Eagles. And then if he doesn't, well, I was right. <laughs> if he does, I was right. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to start using that too. <laughs> anyway, who's next? Uh, Zach Pascal. Nick's favorite player. Yeah. Not going to be expensive. I think yeah. there's a better shot of him being back than I initially gave thought to. I think a lot of it depends on what you, what your number three receiver looks like. If it's Quez, if it's a draft pick, if, if you sign up. I think they need a little more firepower. And Quez has that speed, but he's so unreliable. And Pascal's receiving numbers were decent in Indianapolis, but um, I just think you need a little more than, than just Devontae and – and AJ. So, and again, Quez is under contract, so he'll be here at least through the, through training camp, I think. Um, yeah. I don't think Pascal will be here, but you can certainly make a case that he will. There, yeah, I just I, did it 50, 50. Yeah. If, uh, if Nick says he wants him back, not going to cost a ton. You probably just bring him back. Yeah. yeah. Um, next one is Miles Sanders. And we'll, we'll put Miles Sanders and Boston Scott together here for this um i think boston's back and i think miles is gone yeah same yeah i think i think miles really didn't help himself down the stretch and i'm not sure he would have been back anyway um but if he had a really big postseason and he was good against the giants he had 90 yards but really over the last maybe month of the regular season i think i did the numbers of my 10 obs the other day 
Um, his last seven games, his first, how many games did he play? 20? He played every game. His first 13 games, he averaged 5-2. His last seven, he averaged 3-9, which is pretty pedestrian. And he just didn't look the same. And he finally stayed healthy, healthy enough to play. But if you can't count on your bell cow running back to be at his best down the stretch and in the postseason, you're not going to pay him six, seven million dollars. You can't. And his final numbers look really good. You know, four nine, twelve hundred yards, eleven touchdowns. But I mean, there's a reason Kenny Gainwell was was the guy at the end of the season. He was just he was just playing better. No matter what Nick says, oh, situational third down, blah blah blah. No, he was. He was playing more. He was playing more than Miles. He was getting more touches. He was getting more snaps. He was getting more yards. So I don't know if the decision would have been any different if Miles had continued and and had a really good postseason and and good down the stretch, but I don't think there's any question now he won't be back. And the last one, Isaac Samalu, who they would probably love to have back. Sure. They really like Isaac. You know, I don't know if there's a player – Stoutland likes outside of you know Jason Kelsey more than Isaac Sayamalu. He loves him. Loves him. It's one just of those tough decisions it. you got to make. There's just not the money for him. Yeah. Yeah, I think in a normal year, there's no question. But uh, his value is pretty high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, what if they get in the – just throwing out hypotheticals here. They get an answer from Jason. Jason says, I'm hanging him up. Now you have some more money that you were kind of putting in a pile for Jason Kelsey. Now you have it to play with. Now you'd rather have Jason Kelsey, but now you have this money here. Cam Jurgens, plug and play center. Are you then more likely to bring Isaac back as your right guard? Yeah, there's no question. Um, there's no question that that you're going to have all of a sudden have 14 million. I mean, nobody wants to. Think of it that way, but yeah, I mean, you could probably. I know Spotrack has Sam Mala projected at twelve million a year uh, over two years. How old is Isaac? Twenty nine. He's twenty nine. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not ideal. Like, but uh, that would be my my that would be my go to move if Kelsey decided not to come back. Would be. Get Sam Allo done, but you might. Who knows? He might sign with the, you know, with the Seahawks by the time Kelsey makes his call. That's why it's important that Kelsey, and they might already know. Sam Allo might already know. You know, Howie might already know. Um, but um, I, I think that's the only way he's back. And he's really good. He's a really good player. Yeah, he's he's overcome a lot from early career struggles and. The list, Frank, last year. Yeah. But also, if you feel like, I mean, I do think there's a, a significant drop off from Isaac to Sua or Driscoll or Dillard. I mean, it's just they're not in the same class as him, but they'd also cost a lot less. Yeah. And when you start paying your quarterback, you can't build the same roster around them that you once did. These are the decisions you have to make. There's, you're just not going to have as much talent at every position. You got anything else here? But there's still, you know what? Whatever happens, they're still going to have a, a really good O line. I mean, the worst case, even if you lose Kelsey and Samalo, you still go, you know, Malata and Dickerson and and Jurgens and whoever at right guard, whether it's, um, you know, Sua or, or whoever. Probably come down there like, Sewer or Driscoll, unless I draft someone. Yeah. Um, and I would think it would be Sewer. I don't think it would be Sewer, but really? Yeah, just, yeah, I just think it would be Sewer. And, and, uh, yeah, and then Lane at right tackle. You're still going to have a really good old line. You're going to lose, you know, a Hall of Famer and a guy who's been playing right guard or playing guard for seven years here uh, on and off and still have maybe the top O line in the league or top five O line. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, yeah. got some big news here. Uh, the Saints signed Hugo Amadi. Remember him? Yeah. No. <laughs> he was here for 12 minutes. Really? Yeah. How what he traded that? for him, then traded him like a week oh, later. That's the guy. Yeah. 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 Former Eagle star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's right up there with uh, with um, Frank Gore and uh, 
Um, who was the quarterback um, from the Colts? I can't remember. When uh, when are we talking here? Like in the nineties. <laughs> Come on. Wait a minute. Yeah, because they were going to trade for him and then fell through at the last moment. Um, oh, that uh, is something I want to remind people of. So next week, and we'll, we'll I'll mention this again on the next pod, but next week, Monday at noon begins the, the negotiating window period. Yeah. What people call the legal tampering window. And when the league started that, it was like no deals got out. It was like, yeah, they're really talking. Now it's like it's a free-for-all. We're going to hear about guys agreeing to deals. We're going to hear numbers. Every year, there, there's a deal that falls through. Every year. Yeah. So just nothing's official until it's official. Right. It's good Good to remind everyone of that. Yeah. Fight with the library recently? I mean, they're, they're just so unreasonable. I mean, I just don't know. I mean, like, why would you work in a library just to – just your only reason for existence is to keep people from using its resources. Now, do you think it was just that lady? Or do you think well, it's like a library stance? Like, should no, they try on lady. a different day? No, because the other lady let me, she's like, oh, sure. Yeah, Eagle Eye. I love Eagle Eye. She didn't really say that, but she, she, yeah, she went, walked over and opened the door because the door's locked. So you can't just go in there and do a podcast. They, they open the door and she's like, yeah, use it for as long as you need. And, you know, welcome to the library. Um, can I get you coffee? No, she didn't say that, but she was very welcoming and, and accommodating. It's just that one woman. Why don't I just go and she's not there? Because I don't know her schedule. She, she didn't. Yeah, you can't very well call the library and ask when she's going to be there. That sounds a little when's, too sketchy. When's the mean lady off? <laughs> and then, like, what if she's off, like, you know, Fridays? Well, we don't do a podcast on Friday. So, like. You know, I'd I, like you to give it one more shot. I don't know. I'm afraid of rejection. I just want to see what happens. I'm more curious than anything. Well, there's another library just a few miles away in a different town. I was thinking of trying there. What if I, they ask for your ID? You're not a resident of this town. Yeah. Uh, I would deal with that as it came up. <laughs> I don't think they would ask me for my ID. <laughs> I know these libraries today. Yeah, it was it was disappointing. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I think it's personal. I think so. Yeah, that's She's a good evil. place to end this. Probably that woman's just evil. <laughs> if you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, not you, librarian, please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. That's it. We'll talk to you guys later in the week for agency. Coming around the corner for Rube, I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan.